So, uh, uh, all right, we're recording. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, good morning. Um, Isaiah. Um, let's see, I'm going to do this class, and then I have a meeting tomorrow night, so Victor's going to do tomorrow night, and then Victor's going to do next week while I'm fishing in Wyoming. And uh, But uh, Victor's never taught life like, so I thought we would uh, uh, not throw him to the wolves immediately. Um, but go through, go through what this kind of looks like for us. Why don't we begin? Why don't we begin? I really like this hymn, and this hymn really fits with our lesson today. So let's just sing. Let's just sing this hymn, and we'll uh, we'll read the prayer. We'll read the prayer together. So. Uh, right, that hymn. Hark the voice of Jesus calling, who will go and work today? Fields are white and harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away? Loud and long the master calls you, rich reward he offers free. Who will answer gladly, saying, here am I, send me, send me? If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus, you can say he died for all. If you cannot rouse the wicked with the judgment's red alarms, you can lead the little children to the Savior's waiting arms. Let none hear you idly saying, There is nothing I can do. While the multitudes are dying, and the Master calls for you. Take the task he gives you gladly, let his work your pleasure be. Answer quickly when he calls you, here am I, send me, send me. We pray together. Merciful Lord, you open the prophet Isaiah's eyes so that he can see the wonders of heaven and learn his calling here on earth. Open now our eyes, that we may read and understand Isaiah's heavenly prophecies. Lead us to see your calling for our lives here on earth. May the prophet's words be upon our lips as a burning, purifying fire, and the message of salvation for all nations. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So Isaiah, Isaiah is... Um, uh, I mean, this is information that you can get out of a good study Bible. Um, I'm always fascinated that they don't do a lot of uh, a lot of um, that kind of thing at the beginning of life like lessons. I figure it's because they they probably figure you can read this stuff for yourself. But um, the author is Isaiah, and and he is prophesying. Um, he's a, a prophet of Judah, the southern kingdom. So. This is uh, on into, right, this is like 2 Kings kind of stuff. So we've gone through 1st and 2nd Samuel with David, and or Saul and David and Solomon. We've gone through 1st Kings with a bunch of the kings, and now we're in 2 Kings. And so um, these are, uh, Isaiah prophesied for quite some time, and we can kind of pinpoint the dates because we, we know real well the date of David and uh, subsequently, every other king. I mean, we're we're pretty rock solid. Isaiah actually gives us uh, the time stamp on his prophecies. Some of the prophets don't do as good of a job, but um, Isaiah gives us the time stamp, and you read about that in the lesson today. Um, he prophesied during these kings' reigns, right? The year that Uzziah died. We can pinpoint the year that Isaiah um, was called with with pretty pretty fair certainty. Um, so, you know, about 740 uh, to about 681 um, B.C. So, uh, what is that? Like 61 years. He's an active prophet for quite some time in the Old Testament. Um, one of the longest, attested to um, by his writings. Some of the other prophets, I suppose, could have 
been prophets, right? I don't, I don't think that prophets were necessarily just, you know, prophets for a year or two. Um, I think sometimes prophets were probably prophets for a longer period of time, but their writings are just shorter. What, what got captured, um, the message that was actually written down is perhaps less than um, the time they spent being prophets. We don't really know. Um, uh, also, I think sometimes um, in my my machinations too. I, I'm not sure that we necessarily have everything that a prophet spoke, right? Just like we don't have everything that Jesus spoke, right? Um, is it St. John that testifies to that? Um, yeah, John 20, right? Many more things about Jesus, what Jesus said and did could be written, and it would fill a library, um, John says. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, if I believe in you may have life in his name. Um, I think the same thing could be said about prophets, too. So um, I would personally never never look at Isaiah and say, oh, this is everything that he prophesied. Um, we have the dates kind of of his writing, right? So, so he may have even been prophet longer, I suppose. Um, but we have sort of the dates of his writing, and we can kind of pinpoint those dates. Um, he's also prophesying um, uh, about... Uh, Let's see, 586. He's prophesying about a hundred years before Judah succumbs to the Babylonians. And so it's kind of interesting. Um, Isaiah prophesies all of that stuff, right? So he's uh, prophesying, and he prophesies not only to Judah, but also to Israel. And he has a message for Israel as well, um, because uh, Israel falls in seven. Do you know the date? Anybody know the date? 722, Samaria, the capital of the northern ten tribes, falls to the Assyrians. And um, so in 722, the northern ten tribes are wiped off the map. I mean, we never hear from those people again. Um, some of the descendants are those mixed peoples that become the Sumerians later on in the New Testament. But essentially, the northern ten tribes are gone from history. God's judgment on the northern tribes is complete. And so Isaiah prophesies about that um, in 722, and he also prophesies about the fall of Jerusalem in 586, right? Which is a hundred years. So, so Isaiah actually lives and sees Samaria's downfall, um, and uh, he prophesies that uh, uh, Judah has, you know, I mean, he doesn't say another hundred years, but he says, if you don't turn, um, from your wickedness, um, the Babylonians will come. And he's very specific about the Babylonians. So um, Isaiah's prophecies are, are really cool. It's part of the reason why um, some biblical scholars who are very liberal in their ideology and, and uh, dismiss miracles of God and dismiss prophecy uh, of God would say that Isaiah was written by at least three different authors. That it's not Isaiah writing the whole thing, but that Isaiah is written by three different authors over a period of time. And so um, the, part of, the part of Isaiah that's talking about the Babylonian um, conquering Judah is written by somebody at that time. So it could have been Isaiah because it's 100 years after Isaiah. We know Isaiah started prophesying in 740 B.C. So um, it's got to be another author. Well, that's just garbage. We, we believe that God um, creates miracles. We believe that God works through prophecy. We believe that God can tell the future because he's God. And so um, as Lutheran Christians, we would say, no, um, Isaiah is written by Isaiah. And, uh, and that this is God's word to his people, both in Israel and in Judah, um, during this time. Um, and a lot of it is uh, warning of uh, destruction and captivity, and then also the promise of uh, restoration, redemption, salvation. Um, we get that wonderful Christmas passage um, uh, from Isaiah 7, uh, the stump of Jesse, I'm sorry, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We get, um, uh, uh, what else? Uh, Comfort, comfort my people. We get Isaiah 40. We get right. We get so many passages that we hear at the time of Christmas and Easter from Isaiah. Um, a lot of times Isaiah is called um, the fifth gospel. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah, because Isaiah has so much about um, the coming of the Savior. Oh, Isaiah, Isaiah 53, duh, right? That's the Good Friday, the Good Friday passage, Isaiah 53, Jesus on the cross, right? So, so there's just a tremendous amount of gospel promise in Isaiah in the midst of the warnings of judgment and the fulfillment of judgment and, uh, and captivity and all that, there's a tremendous amount of gospel in the book of Isaiah. And that's, like I said, um, exemplified in the church because Isaiah pops up um, throughout the pericope system. The three-year pericope, that's the readings that we do in church. It's called the pericopes. Those uh, readings that we do in church, Isaiah comes up during that three-year cycle again and again and again, especially in the festival half of the church year, right? The Jesus time from Advent to uh, Pentecost. Isaiah comes up again and again and again and again. All right. Um, all right. Um, there's some cool stuff. If you have the Lutheran Study Bible, I would encourage you to go back and read the couple page spread, 1054, 10, nope, 1084 and 1085. Um, uh, it's got some great stuff on reading Isaiah, Luther, some of Luther's words on Isaiah, um, some of the things going on at the time. Um, so I would encourage you to, uh, to read that. I also noticed that in the uh, enrichment book, everybody here has done my flight, right? We've got no newbies. Um, the enrichment book, I forgot to bring up the three-hole punch. If you want a three-hole punch that, you could walk down to the office and um, punch that in the electronic puncher. It works really well, and then you can put it in your three-ring binder. Um, but um, the Isaiah scroll, if you don't know about the Dead Sea Scrolls or much about them, the Isaiah scroll is kind of an interesting article in this magazine. Um, it talks about uh, um, before they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date to about 200 BC, the, the earliest copy of Isaiah that we had was 1000 AD. 1000 AD. That's like, that's like 900 years after Jesus. And like what would that be? A thousand years plus 700, 1700 years, right? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls have a, have a almost complete copy of the Isaiah Scroll um, just 500 years. Just 500 years from the time that Isaiah wrote it. And it was in basically complete agreement with the, with the testimony that we had from 1000 AD. So it's really, it's really awesome. We can, uh, we can really look at this book of Isaiah and say, um, yeah, the like copying that happened over the course of 1,200 years retained the truth of the Scripture. And so we can easily go backwards the extra 500 years and say, yeah, we, we, have, an authentic, we have an authentic word here from God that has uh, traversed... Uh, 2,700 years of time um, in its in its um, right uh, rightness, I guess you could say. All right, any questions about uh, that? I wanted just to kind of give you that little bit of introduction um, on Isaiah, a little bit more than your study Bible maybe will say, but um, again, I, I would encourage you to go back and, and whatever study Bible you have, just read kind of that. Um, if you don't have a Lutheran, either the Concordia Self-Study Bible, NIV, or the Lutheran Study Bible, the ESV version, understand that another, another study Bible might attribute Isaiah to more than one author. Ignore that silliness. Ignore that silliness. Um, but, but you might find a study Bible that would do that. Um, so, number one, to better understand Isaiah's message, we need to understand the time and the place where he wrote it. So 2 Chronicles 26 talks about the reign of King Uzziah. Suppose you have taken a political poll in Judah during King Uzziah's reign. Check the statements that you think such a poll might have found to be true. So what? Uh, uh, name one that you checked. 
Name one that you check, Mark. Um, the king one has won the approval of the nation's farmers for his agricultural policy. All right. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like things were going uh, very well in terms of agriculture and commerce, right? What's another one that you checked? Uh, most of them. Most of them. Most of them thought, you know, hey, we. Have, I mean, they really seen themselves as being. Uh, yeah, the the biggest guy in the in the neighborhood. Yeah, you could you could probably almost make a case of checking all of them almost, right? Did anybody check all of them? I checked the true and false for you. Oh true and false. Which ones didn't you which which ones didn't you check? Uh, the nation is in ter terrible terrible turmoil. Oh that one, yes, okay. Yeah, you wouldn't have checked yes to that one. That was yeah. they were not in yeah. terrible turmoil. They weren't. No, they were strong, and they were becoming stronger. Uh, you know, that's why I said they seen themselves as, as like I say, the biggest, the biggest bully in the neighborhood. You know. Type and I wouldn't have checked the last one. Either. And and the last one, right? Yeah. No, the long term. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem and and uh, um, um, fortifications and uh, towers out in the wilderness. It talked about um, right protection of the of the nation. Uh, Uzziah ruled in Judah for 52 years. Uh, this kind of stability and leadership usually inspires national confidence. Isaiah became a prophet in the in the in Judah in the year Uzziah died. What might citizens of Judah um, be thinking about for their future? What kinds of questions do you think people were uh, worried about and asking when the king dies? What's going to continue? What's going to is, is work going to continue, right? Are the construction projects that we're in the middle of with Uzziah going to dry up, right? And, well, and not be funded. The military. Was it going What's to going to happen to the military? And is his son going to be as is his, as his father? Is his son going to be as good of a king as his father, all right? Any others? Is the economy going to keep booming? Is the economy going to keep booming, right? Are we going to be able to keep it deserved? And then, not only the economy, but I think um, foreign policy too, right? Yes. Uh, are we going to continue to be able to exert pressure and taxes from the surrounding nations, right? Are we going to keep getting um, payments from Philistines? Are we going to keep getting payments from the Amorites? Uh, is that going to continue? Um, because that adds to the economy. A small nation like that, that's, that's a boon for the economy. Um, if you're getting taxes paid from other nations, the king probably doesn't exert as much taxes on the people, right? So the whole picture is is great. Um, it, is it going to continue? Because honestly, the people have seen it not continue, right? There have been times where it hasn't gone well, right? Um, oh, Solomon's son split the nation. Right. Um, so, so people have uh, seen, or their grandparents, great grandparents, have seen things go very wrong with the nation. So, um, probably pretty typical kinds of, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Um, probably more so then than now. Honestly, I mean, people get really torqued about politics nowadays. But honestly, is your life a lot different with the past six presidents? It changed quite a bit, but then I was a government worker. <laughs> Maybe if you're a government worker, things can change, and government workers can lose jobs, right, and things like that. But honestly, eh, we're a pretty blessed nation, regardless of who the president is. There's some policies that I don't like. There's some there's some moral things that have decayed, and I think I think uh, you know as. Um, as leaders of the nation, uh, they haven't always done a good job of, of uh, checking some of those things. But honestly, I don't know, 401k is a little more, a little less, but, but we don't live in Africa. Right? Well, we, we don't, if you look we, at the last six presidents you're <coughs> talking about, are they one bit different than you, Ryan? You, I mean, let's face it, they all got eagles the size of this room. Yep, yep. And which gets them into trouble every time. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. They're not a lot different. But, but, but back then, under a kingship, right, things could go south so much quicker than in a democracy. 
right? There's there are checks and balances in a democracy. There are things that kind of kind of keep us level more or less, right? We might walk through life like this. In a monarchy, things can be like this, right? I mean, they can be up and down as fast as a king dies. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 2 Chronicles 26, 16 to 23, what clues does this passage give about the spiritual condition of Judah at the time? Well, I don't know. I I see that. I think the priests were doing a pretty good job. I mean, let's face it. He walked in there, and eighty, right. of, them, 80 of them come up and said, uh, "I don't know." So no, was I. I I am I am a. Uh, uh, that is such a cool story because. Um, well, let's answer B first. I think B should have been the first one. What led Uzziah to try to usurp the authority that God had given only to the priesthood under the covenant? All right, pride and arrogance, right? So now, now back to A. What's going on in the country? When it talks about Uzziah coming to power, when it talks about Uzziah, but forget for a second Uzziah going into the temple, but when it talks about Uzziah coming to power, what's the spiritual condition of the nation? So, so, they're more, they're more, uh leading into uh, all the things that they are that they are achieving or they see themselves as achieving. They're building, they're they're got rich farmland, you know, they're getting taxes like you say from everybody else around. So they I think they see themselves as pretty good, but the only problem is is when that happens, what happens to our our moral compass then? It goes astray because you know, we're so sure that everything we're doing is what's making us prosperous, not that God is allowing us to be prosperous. Who was Uzziah's father? A guy named Amaziah. Am Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. And as soon as the royal power was firmly his, he killed his servants, who had struck down the king, his father. But he did not put the children to death, according to what was written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded fathers shall not die because of their children, nor children because of their fathers. And then, um, Amaziah's idolatry, Second uh, Chronicles 25, 14. After Amaziah came from striking down the Edomites, he brought the, the gods of the men of Seir and set them up as his gods and worshipped them, making offerings to them. Therefore Yahweh was angry with Amaziah and sent to him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people who did not deliver their own people from your hand? But as he was speaking, the king said to him, Have we made you a royal counselor? Stop. Why should you be struck down? So the prophet stopped but said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. And then Israel strikes him down. And then Uzziah, uh, the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it isn't here. Hold on. So you have to actually turn to 2 Kings for what I was thinking of. Because I don't think it's there. 2 Kings. Before Hezekiah, before Ahaz, Amaziah. I'm on page 540, or 594. That's Hezekiah, not. Oh, Brown. Like 2 Kings 15. Is it 15? Oh, there we go. Azariah. 
Azariah is Uzziah. Same guy. Oh. Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he reigned. His mother, blah, blah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken down. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. What is going on in Israel? What does that mean? The high places were not taken down. It means gods and other gods because I've been to that high place. It means other gods. Yeah. Um, the people are the people are still dabbling in the idolatry of the Canaanites. And high places, why did they worship on high places? Be closer to God. Be closer to God, right? The high places are places where the gods dwelt. Right? Mount Olympus for the Greeks. Um, the high places are the places of God. Why did Moses go up on Mount Sinai to meet God? Right? I mean, even, even Yahweh uses that imagery. Um, he uses it rightly. Um, the others are pagans and not real gods. But um, the, people, the people set up these idol worship places on high places. My guess is that when Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal, um, during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, uh, my guess is that Mount Carmel was a high place. That'd be my guess. Mount Carmel was a high place, and so he met he met the prophets of Baal on their turf, right? Which is even which is even more stunning because of that stunning victory, right? That's that um, altar and then uh, call fire from heaven thing, and Elijah, Yahweh brings fire and burns up the whole offering, and then they. Uh, um, slaughter all the prophets of Baal, like 300 guys get slaughtered by the people, right? I assume Mount Carmel was a high place. Um, high places are places where they had set up altars to foreign gods, to other gods, and they worshipped um, at those high places other gods. And so the people of Israel have kind of a mixture of religions going on. There are some Yahweh stuff going on, but there's also idolatry going on. Um, the priests at the temple during Uzziah's reign um, chased Uzziah out of the temple after he struck with leprosy um, because he disobeyed God's will. Um, and uh, uh, the, those priests seemed to be faithful, um, but um, high places weren't taken down. There are other kings who take down the high places and command that the people not worship idols. Uzziah doesn't do that. Amaziah doesn't do that, his father. And Jotham, um, Uzziah, uh, Uzziah's son, doesn't do that. Right? So they fail, although they may, they may uh, uh, be faithful um, to the Lord, um, they still fail to bring any kind of a spiritual reformation like, uh, like a guy like Joash did. Uh, Joash, Joash did, or uh, Josiah did, right? Those are good kings of Judah that bring reform, uh, spiritual reform on the people. So um, it's an interesting thing. You know, Uzziah says, it said of Uzziah that he did, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Well, but he also failed. But it seems as though Isaiah is still saved, still a believer. It, it seems that Jotham, um, Jotham is actually better than his father was. Um, right? It doesn't say that he was struck. Uh, he's not listed as a bad king of Judah. So Uzziah is probably saved. It's kind of an interesting, interesting story. Vicar? Yeah. I, you know, when I, when I was reading through this, I it, it really reminded me of that vending machine God mentality. We will be faithful because this is what we can get out of God. And so then having those other high places are just kind of like, well, what can we get out of this God? What can we oh, yeah. get out of this God? You know, and so, you know, things are going really well. So they're faithful, but not for the right reasons. Right. It's only what they yep. can get out of it. And, and I really don't doubt, I really don't doubt that Uzziah, right, pride overtakes him and he goes into the temple to do the priestly work because, hey, king and priest and a lot of foreign cultures went together. You were king and priest. You got to do it all. That would be my guess. And pride overtook him, and the priest confronted him, and he struck with leprosy, and he goes out from the temple, 
You know, it doesn't say that he repented. It doesn't say that he's in heaven. But I think from kind of the context of the writings of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, that, that he probably is in heaven. I, I don't think that he went and never repented. Um, because, because the scriptures say that he is a king who did right in the eyes of the Lord. Although, he failed in some places. Right? Um, I think the Lord... His leprosy never went away. Though. I think the, his leprosy never went away. Right? There's consequences to sin. Exactly. Consequences to sin. Um, yeah. Um, right? If you cheat on your spouse... Well, you can work on your marriage and come back together, but guess what? There's going to be consequences for the rest of your marriage. There's going to be consequences for the rest of your marriage. I, I mean, that's just there's consequences to sin. You can rob a bank and um, apologize to the authorities and to the owners and to God and receive forgiveness. You're still going to go to jail. Right? Consequences for sin. And so, yeah, I think uh, Uzziah receives a temporal consequence for his sin. Absolutely. But I don't think that removes him from God's family. All right? So I just wanted to get that kind of clear because I think that the writers of the Life Light Study were sort of ambiguous as to what's up with Uzziah. 2 Chronicles 27, number 3, the verses tell us about the reign of Jotham, Uzziah's son and the successor to Judah's throne. Summarize Jotham's reign. It said, follow the Lord, conquered nations, was profitable, and improved living conditions in Judah. Okay. Good. What didn't he have that Uzziah had? What did he not have troubles with, it seems? What was Uzziah's problem at the temple? The leprosy? Or the His pride. pride. Oh, pride. It doesn't seem that Jotham had that same pitfall of pride. But he didn't. He he just continued what his father had done. He, he didn't really. He didn't really make his own mark. You know. He just kind of kept everything on even you know, as he saw it. Um. Maybe. I mean. I'm not sure. He's I don't. Been, he only reigned for sixteen years. So. Yeah. I don't know. I mean. Um, just because he continues what's going on, I mean, what that, what I think that really means is things continue to go really well, right? He was a good king that continued what was happening in the nation. He didn't, didn't muck it up. He didn't muck up what was going on. So, I mean, from that standpoint, I, I think he probably made a name for himself. He built more. Uh, he built other towers that his father didn't. He built more fortifications that his father didn't. He repaired. He repaired a substantially important uh, gate, I believe. You get a little bit more information if you read. I wish they would have had you read the Second Kings um, passages about these guys. Also, you get a little bit more um, information. Um, he is the one that uh, that defeated the Ammonites and received huge amounts of uh, of tribute from them. All right. It doesn't talk about Uzziah. I said that earlier. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't really Uzziah that they talk about the tribute. Jotham. Jotham extracted huge tribute from uh, the Ammonites, for instance. So I think there's a name. I think there's a name for him. Um, uh, but he still allowed the worship of idols. But but he still didn't take down the high places, right? So he didn't he didn't lead a spiritual reformation, even though he was a man of God. Um, he didn't re he didn't lead any. Uh, but the people still followed corrupt practices. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord and did much building on the wall of Ophel, wherever that is. Um, moreover, he built cities in the hill country and Judah and forts. I mean, the dude, the dude did a lot in extension of his father's um, good um, acts. Um, yeah, so verse 2, um, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. 
except he did not enter the temple of the Lord. Kind of interesting, right? I think that sentence helps us say, you know what, Uzziah is not lost, right? Jotham did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Uzziah had a couple of problems, sinful problems. Um, so I think from that, from that in the Second Kings passage, I really think um, Uzziah is not a lost. If you one. saw your dad go in there and come out with leprosy, you wouldn't go in there either. <laughs> Right? A, a living testimony, a living testimony to say, hmm, um, Yahweh means what he says. Yeah, they would. Right? Yahweh means what he says. So, uh, not, not going to have that problem. Um, letter B, reread verse 2. What hint of the spiritual dry rod in Judah's soul? Well, we already talked about that. The people still follow corrupt practices, right? The high places were not were not taken down. Uzziah and Jotham were not, I don't know, were they not strong enough to turn the people back to the Lord? So often, so often in the history of Israel and Judah, kind of the, the idea is that is, uh, as the king goes, so go the people. So you have a righteous king, the people are righteous. If you have a wicked king, the people turn to idolatry and are wicked. I mean, that goes, that goes uh, on a lot. So um, it's sort of an interesting thing that Uzziah and Jotham um, don't take down the high places. I, I don't know if they do that in, in, um, to curry the favor of the people, right? Um, more important to have a strong nation than to torque people off and have uh, rebellion or unrest or things like that. So they kind of maybe settle for the spiritual condition of Judah. Uh, kind of odd, right? Um, it's kind of interesting, though, right? So they kind of settle for the spiritual condition of, of Judah. Who comes on the scene the year that Uzziah dies? Isaiah. Prophet of God. And, and Isaiah unloads both barrels. You read that, right? We'll read it in a minute. Isaiah unloads both barrels on Judah. Right? He unloads both barrels uh, of law on God's people. So sort of an interesting, an interesting thing. Um, it's not uh, Isaiah that's sent to Jotham and say, look, your father didn't take down the high places. Take down the high places. Make the people turn back to the Lord. Right? Um, you don't get that. You just have Isaiah coming on the scene and proclaiming God's word and, and saying, look, yeah, you guys need to get this straightened out spiritually or there's going to be problems. There's going to be consequences. Um, so the whole thing's kind of an interesting thing, but where Uzziah and Jotham fail in the spiritual reformation, Isaiah comes on the scene. Right? Isaiah comes on the scene, and that's where we have Isaiah's message of law, his warnings to the people, uh, the promise of redemption for those who turn back, etc. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Does, uh, so with all of that, does that mean like... Um in verse 9, this is, and Jotham slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Does that mean, so he did what his fathers were doing as well? No, that, um, not exactly. Um, we know that Jotham was righteous because of what it says. Um, the slept with their fathers means they died. And, and literally what they did was, so burial was typically in a cave. And in the cave, they would have a carved shelf where the body was laid. After that body was decomposed, right, and uh, kind of dust, bones, um, they would, uh, the next person in the family to die, they would, they would scoop up all those bones and put them back into a hole with everybody else in the family who's died. Gotcha. Literally slept with their fathers, and then they lay out the new dead person. Gotcha. Yeah, Bizarre, awesome. right? Yeah. Bizarre, oh, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Uh, so, so slept with their fathers. I mean, literally, kind of literally slept with their fathers, but a, a euphemism for died. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Um, oh, so uh, so Uzziah and Jotham were were maybe not strong enough to turn people back to the Lord, maybe maybe capitulated just so that they could have a strong nation. Um, so here's my question that the lifelight didn't ask. What, what might this say about our witness in the world? 
What might this say about our witness in the world? We're no better. Hmm. Well, we're no better. Yeah? I mean, I don't see too many Missouri Senate Lutherans on the street corner when <laughs> like that. I mean, we preach with love. Right. And we, and we minister to people with love, but not with... Do you realize what's going to happen if you don't open your eyes up? We're not fear mongers, and that's I think is probably our problem. We don't we don't really give them the facts. We always try because you know we you know we, we concentrate on Jesus's love for us, and we don't we don't sometimes I, remember. That. I think I think that is a tremendous failing in the Christian witness. I think so too. Just proclaim the gospel, proclaim the gospel, proclaim the gospel. And what do we do about sin? We so often do not confront sin in the lives of people. The gospel does no good if people do not recognize their sin and repent. Preach Jesus all you want and the person will still go to hell. That's kind of like the king. We're kind of like the king, you know? Uh, we are kind of like the king. Turn a blind eye to sin. Show them how I live my life and what a good God-fearing life is, but don't tell them they have to change. Yes. yes. See, I think that's exactly what I was thinking of as I read this. It was like, oh my gosh. We're like Uzziah and Jotham far too often. Far too often. We ignore the high places that are set up and the idolatry that goes on all around us. We tend to think God will take care of it. You know? Or, or we just don't care, honestly. I don't think it's so much we don't care, but you know, sometimes it's like, you know, do not judge, lest you be judged yourself. And, I mean, we got yeah. all these, we and, got all these little verses running around in our heads. We don't want to and, come exactly. and that is, yeah, we don't and that is the, most, the most ridiculously and incorrectly used verse probably in I the know, Bible. I know. Because, is, because pointing out what God's law says is not judging anyone. It's simply speaking the truth of God's word. Judging, judging would be um, you are going to hell and there's no hope for you. Judging, judging is what um, that crazy Baptist church, um, Westboro Baptist <laughs> Church does. That's judging. Yes, that's that's judging. You're a homosexual and you're going to hell and there's no hope for you. Yeah, no, that's judging. But saying, but saying in a loving way, homosexuality is not God's plan for your life, is not judging. It's simply speaking a truth. But, but how often are we like Uzziah and Jotham and refuse to speak that truth? And, and instead, we substitute it with, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And, and so there are, I mean, I don't not to get off on one, one uh, so verse. So come back but, with, but, Jesus loves you, and you know what? God is also... Jesus God. loves you. Jesus loves you, but how you're living. Your premarital sex is not God's will for your life. Your intent on getting divorced is not God's will for your life. Jesus loves you, but, but homosexuality is not God's will for your life. Um, Jesus loves you, but yelling at your parents all the time is not God's will for your life. Well, um, when I was involved with uh, education, what struck me is that the Jewish people were very vocal about things from what you could do at Christmas parties and what you couldn't do to rearranging ske uh, football schedules because they fell on the night of a holi Jewish holiday, to having the Christmas vacation changed to a winter vacation or winter break. And Lutherans said, well, that's okay. We didn't make a fuss because we couldn't have a manger in the building or a Christmas symbols. We 
As long as they were Jewish, they were fine. Yeah, or that's, non denominational. Now, see, that's a, that's, a, that's another issue. And that's another issue, and this is what I would say to that. So what? Well, it reminds me that they're more vocal about saying what they believe under, than what we I understand that. Here's the deal. As, as Christians, as Christians, um, it is not a sin or not to have a manger scene. It is not a sin or not to have a Christmas vacation. It, it's, it's not. Um, we've never made a big deal about that. Prayer in school, right? We've never made a big deal about demanding prayer in school. It's like, you can pray in school. What are you talking about? I don't, I don't want the Muslim teacher leading my children in prayer in school. So the LCMS has never been a big deal, had a big deal about prayer in school. If they take away, if they take away Christmas vacation, they take away Christmas vacation. I mean, so, so what? They won't stop our celebration of the nativity. That's what's important. You know, for a long time we tried to try its Xmas. That's not so anymore. They've taken that out and replaced it back again to Christmas. Yeah. Um, you know, the funny thing about uh, people who started calling it Xmas, that's actually, that's actually uh, um, an anagram from the early Christian church. X, Xmas, actually, the X stands for Christ. You know the PX Cairo? But they weren't aware of the that. The X is the Chi. So Xmas, yeah, well, it was actually started by Christians. Christians are the ones that started calling it Xmas, but then the then the world kind of caught on and said, "Oh, well, we can take Christ out of Christmas." And then Christians reverted and said, "Don't take Christ out of Christmas." And it's like, we're not, we're not. So, um, yeah, um, I think we get worked up too much about those kinds of things because honestly, those kinds of things aren't in the Bible, and those kinds of things really don't matter. They don't matter. Um, what matters is people's hearts. That's what matters. And so, so it's an interesting thing as Christians sometimes, not only do we sort of uh, put blinders up for sin, but then we make like majors out of minor things too. And it's like, yeah, don't, don't expend our energy making, making major things out of things that are actually very minor. Care about the sin of the people around you and the faith or lack of faith of the people around you. And that's what Uzziah and Jotham seem to not have done. And I think it's a, a great reminder for us to point out the high places in people's lives and, and call for them to tear them down and turn to Yahweh in repentant faith. So are we, are we, is our reaction more because we think we're having something taken away from us? I mean, I think yes. that's how I think that's how we feel. You know, we think, no, you can't keep and doing this. And they are life, good, fame, child, and wife. Will these yeah. all be gone? Yeah. They yet have nothing won. The kingdom ours remaineth. Um, I don't care what they call Christmas. I know what it is. I don't care if they give vacation or not. I still will celebrate Christmas. I don't care. Um, I, I don't care if, uh, I, I don't know, if, if we become a communist nation and they say that we can't worship anymore, I don't care, I still will, yes. right? Um, so, so yeah, Dee, I think, I think sometimes we react because, hey, we're Americans and we have rights and don't take away our rights. Yeah. I, it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Your rights, your rights are not talked about in the Bible. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of, right, the things that we stand on as Americans are not in the Bible. They're not in the Bible, right? Uh, oh my gosh, right? Um, prayer in schools, not in the Bible. We would rather not have it in schools because of the theological issues with that. Right, um, Christmas vacation not in the Bible, um, nativities <coughs> in the public square not in the Bible. Um, you know the the big stink about taking down the Ten Commandments in courtrooms. I, I find it uh, I find it laughable because it's like, well, if it's not based on Judeo Christianity, what is the law based on? 
right? Now, all natural law is based on God's law, Ten Commandments. People are blinded to that, but I don't care. They can take down the Ten Commandments in courtrooms. I mean, they, they can do that. It doesn't affect my faith and my witness. It doesn't affect my faith and my witness. I find it sad. I find the encroachment of secular society and the sinful world troubling. But, but at the end of the day, I can be a Christian in any nation in the world. I can be a Christian regardless of whatever. Now, are things easier? Absolutely. But you know what? Easier things are sometimes bad for the church. Easier things are sometimes bad for the church. Where is the, where is the Lutheran church, actually the Christian church, growing the most right now? Africa. Why? Because things aren't good. Things aren't good. And, and in North Africa, the Muslims are persecuting the church like nobody's business, and it's never in the news, but they are persecuting the church like nobody's business. And the church grows because things aren't good. I think, I think, spiritual, I think spiritual laziness is fraught in America because we have things very good. And maybe, maybe the church that needs things not to be so good. I say that, I really don't want it to be that way, but but it's the, it's still the truth. I, hate, I sure hate to have to live in that world. I, I, I would too, but maybe we should. Maybe we should. Nancy? I don't want to get too far off base, but there, and, and I am quite sure that all of the protesters at uh, outside of abortion clinics are not Christian, but there are a lot of Christians that are very verbal about that, and isn't that what we should be, you know, saying, this is not right, this is not okay, um, that, and that's a forum. You that know, is that. one, that is one way to express God's law. Absolutely. Not violently, just... And, and that's, why, that's why, you know, like Lutherans for Life will do marches and take part in, in um, anti-abortion marches and uh, to, bring, to bring light on God's law. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's being loud about this is not God's will. That is, that is, that is uh, standing on the street corner proclaiming God's law, right? I don't think we always have to do that, but but I mean, you know plenty of people who are don't care about their sin, don't care about faith in Christ, right? You know plenty of people that you can speak to individually about, hey, you know, maybe it's maybe it's time to think about Jesus a little bit more. Right? Maybe it's time, maybe it's time to understand a little bit more that that your your sin actually separates you from God. So uh, I just thought that was an interesting, uh, interesting question. Um, thinking of Uzziah and Jotham and how they they really didn't do the spiritual awakening that they could have as kings. They could have done that. As the king goes, so go the people. You know, maybe not everybody, but but a heck of a lot more. They had the power to go to the high places and tear down the altars and post signs: "Ye shall not worship here to foreign gods anymore." Ye shall worship at the temple only. Right? They, they had the power to do that, and they did it. Right? And so that was just, you know, kind of kind of us thinking about how we are Uzziah and Jotham sometimes. All right, number four. Uh, now read Isaiah 1, 21 to 23. How would you list or summarize the Lord's main complaints against his people? What were some of the phrases that you picked up on? All right, bribes, right? They love bribes. They love money for themselves. What else? I like that whore to sin. That was really Say cool. that again. A whore to sin. Yeah, so, so um, in, the, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, um, body language, right? Um, the Old Testament, you know, uh, uses some body language sometimes, and it talks about whores. Well, what, what, what's that? What does that, what does that word actually mean? Well, maybe not actually mean. I know what it actually means. What does that word symbolize? How's that? The selling of your body. The selling of your body, right? And what's the what's the key word there in our relationship with God that 
whoredom would refer to. If you are a whore, you are unfaithful. You are unfaithful. Who was the who is the prophet who married a prostitute? Hosea married a prostitute. And guess what? She was unfaithful. She must have liked whoring or something. She was unfaithful. And every time she was unfaithful and got into the service of a John, I guess, um, the Lord said to Hosea, go, redeem her buy her back. And so he would literally go and buy her back from whoever controlled her life. And she would be a wife again. And then she would go and, I don't know, go into that life again. I have no idea how that even, like, worked. <laughs> the machinations of my mind just can't even grasp that. It's like, gee, God, thank you so much. Um, and then the two poor sons... The, the two sons that Hosea had, I forget what their names were, but their names, like, meant something. You know, like, unfaithfulness and, I don't know, um, terrible, right? It's like, oh, well, thank you. I'm glad that our whole family could be object lessons for uh, the children's message today, right? It's, it's like the whole family, the whole family, Hosea's whole family became the object lesson for Israel, right? Hosea married a whore, just like... Yahweh married a whore. His people. Really, really kind of a stark thing. So it's really brought to light in the book of Hosea. But, but uh, here, here Isaiah uses the language too. The people have sold themselves to foreign gods. They have been unfaithful to the Lord, to Yahweh, who, who called them out of darkness into the marvelous light. What other, what other words... Everything they touch is corrupt. Even their wine is no good. Everything is corrupt. Nothing. Everything you, everything right? you touch is. And, and it's corrupted because of you. All right. What other what other words pop out at you? Well, they weren't taking care of the orphans and widows. No, no, no care for orphans and widows. There's no justice. Right. The system that God set up to take care of people in the Old Testament was being trampled on. And then yeah, he calls them thieves and robbers too. What's what's that? I think all of those things boil down to really one thing. What were the people most interested in? Themselves. That's exactly right, right? And isn't that isn't that what sin is? Luther says that. Luther says sin sin is turning in on yourself. I think that's Luther that says that. Um, sin is turning in on yourself. I think it's all, all very selfish. Everybody is out for themselves. Uh, number five, uh, reread your answer to number four. In view of matters facing you and your nation today, put a star beside those problems on your list to which you yourself have at times contributed, either by what you did or by what you failed to do. Well, that's fine. You can do that. That's awesome. But um, the the big star, right? If we boil that all down to looking out for yourself, right? Guilty, right? How often are how often are we guilty of the same of the same thing? Um, I think that's just really very true. Finally, read Isaiah 1:18. Why is this verse such good news for you personally? Yeah, so um, uh, the Lord, what can the Lord do? Make us perfect. Say again? Make us perfect. Ma make us perfect in His sight. He can completely take away the stain of sin. Why is that good news? Because we can't do it. So what? He does it and we have eternal life with Him. That's nice. What's the problem with sin? It feels so good. Why is sin a problem? Why does God decide sin is a problem? Takes your focus off of Him. Yeah, a bigger problem than that, though. I still say, so what? <laughs> Romans 3, 23. 
for the wages of sin is death. Is death. The problem with sin is that it deserves death. That's the problem of sin. It's not just that we're sinful. So what? You're sinful before God. Congratulations. I, so what? I don't care. It feels good. Me and God are me and God are fine because I declare us to be fine. What's the problem with sin? The problem with sin is that it deserves death. And that is eternal death. And what is eternal death? Complete separation. Separation from God. Complete and utter separation from God. That's the problem with sin. And maybe that's what we should say to people. Listen, do you realize that if you die tonight and you have not got any kind of a relationship with you with will be separated from him yeah. forever. And that's a long, long yeah. time. It's a long, long time. Um, so so then, so then, think about this. If you just say, hey, the good news is that God removes the stain of sin. Well, that's nice. But what does that mean? See, this is really good news because as God takes away the stain of sin, He takes away the thing that separates you from Him. That's why it's good news. See, that's another thing that we do too. Jesus forgives your sins. Jesus forgives your sins. Jesus, what does that mean? As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sin from me. Psalm 103. So, so what? What's what does that mean? Jesus died for your sins. Jesus takes away your sins. Jesus pays for your sins. It means that he takes away the thing that sin causes. Eternal separation from him. Eternal death. That's what he takes away. And that's why forgiveness is such good news. It's not just, it's not just because your sins are forgiven and you can start over with your life. No, he removes the barrier. He removes the impediment between God and man. And that is why it's good news. Other thoughts or questions on that? All right, let's get, actually get to the text, which is cool. All right, so Isaiah 6. Starts in Isaiah 6 because, well, I don't know. Isaiah wrote his book kind of weirdly, right? You would think that this would maybe be the first thing that he writes. It's not. Um, it's probably the first thing that happened, um, but it's not the first thing Isaiah writes. It's kind of like he wrote a message from the Lord and then said, oh, I should include this story. I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. But Isaiah 6, 1 to 7, let's just read this again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, Yahweh Sabaoth. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that had been taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Oh, even through, or even though God's people in Judah in the 7th century B.C. Uh, looked proper and prosperous uh, to outside observers, the Lord knew their spiritual poverty. He saw their need even when most of them did not. So God sent prophets to confront them with their sin and to warn them to repent. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord, uh, probably in a vision, supernatural way, right? I, I, I think that's obvious. Um, as did Peter in Acts 10, or Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, or John in Revelation. Um, Isaiah tells how God called him to be a spokesman or a prophet. What three words might you choose if you were to describe that vision? Give me one word to describe a vision. 
One word? One word. Well, you were supposed to pick three. Uh, uh, awesome. Awesome. All right, awesome. I saw the word. Oh, well. That's what exactly what I was. was three words. He saw the word. Awesome. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Oh, I get it. Three words, so you said he saw God. Oh, interesting. It's a completely wrong answer, but you know. Sorry. I'm here. No, I. That's that's funny. That's that's highly that's highly literal. Um, that's good. No, I can't say that that's wrong, right? I mean, you did what it, what the question asked. I think what the question meant is three separate words. Use three separate words to describe the encounter. So, Mark, I had magnificent, frightening, and puzzling. Magnificent, frightening, puzzling. Terrifying. Terrifying. Stunning. Stunning. I had intimidating. Intimidating. Inspiring. Inspiring. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Right. I think those are all good adjectives to describe but it, it should have said three adjectives to describe and then you wouldn't have said he saw god um so it's a good it's a great answer yeah great answer. you're a little on the slow side oh. <laughs> oh well you know you did what it said um, uh, the flaws in the question they should have said three adjectives yeah then you would have had it um, what exactly did Isaiah see on that day? Oh, Nancy, what did he see? <laughs> yes, he saw. He saw the Lord. That's right. He saw. He saw the Lord. You know what's fascinating about this? What doesn't Isaiah do? In terms of the Lord, he didn't what, die. Well, he didn't die. But what does Isaiah in his words not do regarding the Lord? He doesn't describe the Lord at all. Yeah, just his robe. Isn't that fascinating? His robe. He says that the robe, the train of the robe filled the temple, but it's all on what's going on around, around, around right? The, the picture is what's happening with the seraphim more than Yahweh. He doesn't describe Yahweh. Isn't that I, that's fascinating? It made me picture like this light. And then this flowing, and then but you just right, right. I mean, what's the what's the? I mean, that's a that's a that's an interesting description, Angela. Right. So was the was he unable to describe Yahweh? Right. Just kind of unable to describe Yahweh because indistinct. But what was distinct? What was going on around these seraphim flying next to the throne? But they're they're standing. But they're flying. That that are like I'm no, the that. wings. There's a, it tells you what. what and they're. above him stood the oh. seraphim. Yeah, I think that I, stood. I, I, was, I think that yeah. stood as in as in in place above him. They were yeah, in. No, just right. Like that going, yeah. I, I, I think. I think. They're pretty. They're pretty fun. They're yeah, I've never really. They're disjointed. <laughs> I've never really. Uh, I've never really keyed in on that word. Thank you. That's interesting. Uh, bother me now forever. Um, <laughs> but if he had to wait, 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 wait. Here it is. The the uh, the Lutheran Study Bible stood means positioned, as in stood guard. And they were flying while they were in it. So yeah, that that see that's how I've always taken it. Right? They're just in position. Right there. The That's that was funny, funny thing. What's in on that? Just wonders there. Um, well, actually, my bigger question is: there's at least two. Yeah, because they're calling. To the but Lord. but seraphim would be plural. So how many are there? Right there, there could actually be more, but it's one called to another, and so we always picture it as two. But honestly, heavenly throne room. How many seraphim are there? Thousands. And could you imagine? Could you imagine if all of them the same? Yeah. Oh. Talking about bring down the house, right? Um, That's why I shook. Yeah, right? That yeah, moves with what? Right? Can you imagine if both of them called out or five of them called out? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's kind of interesting. So, yes, yeah, seraphim is, we always picture it as two because um, stood the seraphim, each had six wings. 
right? All the language is, is the ability to have more than two, and it simply says one called to another and said. That doesn't, that doesn't discount that there were more than two. I don't know. Um, kind of interesting. But we always, you always see, if you see an artwork of this event, there's always two. There's two seraphim. I think we always picture it kind of like that um, because of how it's read. But um, what exactly did Isaiah hear? Holy, 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 Lord. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is praise to Yahweh going on, right? Praise to Yahweh going on. Um, uh, we pick up the other thing in a minute, but what's the other thing that he heard? Forgiveness. A word of forgiveness, right? So there is praise of Yahweh, and there's a word of forgiveness. And that confuses me because I didn't know angels forgave sin. Your pastor does. Yeah, that's true. The angel is a servant of the Lord. So the angel speaks the word of forgiveness to Isaiah. Yeah, kind of cool, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I never thought, thought of that. that. I never thought of Kind of cool. Yeah. The angel, as a servant of the Lord, speaks the word of Yahweh's forgiveness. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, Riri verse 5. How did Isaiah respond to the vision? How did Isaiah respond to the vision? He talked to his not, lost. Not, not as you might expect. And that word woe, that word woe is really a declaration that, uh, that Isaiah is as good as dead. dead. Right? That word, that word is just Isaiah is as good as dead. Woe is me. And why is there woe? Why is there death and destruction coming Isaiah's way? Because he's and, and he's a sinner, right? Woe to me for I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among the people of unclean lips. I am sinful and my people are sinful. And, and it's the recognition. See, I bring this up um, every so often in church. Um, what's the truth that when... Um, uh, what am I saying? All right, slow down. <laughs> Let my mind catch up to my words, right? We walk into church, and what do we confess about that space? We're two or three gathered in my name. There I am also in the midst of them. Uh, Yahweh is present in word and sacrament. We come literally into the Lord's presence on Sunday morning. What should our reaction be? Fear. Fear. And woe is me. Woe is me. Right? Our reaction should be, woe is me. How do we start the service? By declaring, woe is me. Right? Now, we don't say, woe is me, but in those words of, of confession, that is essentially what we're saying. Um, uh, uh, I confess to you that I am simple and unclean, I've sinned in my thoughts, words, and deed. Um, uh, uh, oh, for crying out loud, I can't think of the stupid <laughs> words. Um, uh, we, we deserve your present and eternal punishment. punishment. Woe is me. But I am heartily sorry. That's, that. that's what we're saying. When we come to the Lord's presence, we say that um, I, I, I deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But... It's Isaiah's words. What was me? I deserve eternal punishment. What was me? Why? Because I'm sinful. I have sinned in my thoughts, words, and deeds. By what I've done and by what I've left undone. I deserve woe. I deserve to die. And yet, what happens? The angel. <laughs> Forget your sin. No. <laughs> I kind, of like, I kind of like that, right? Um, but, but the Lord, the Lord's servant, forgives your sins. And Luther says this is just as valid and certain as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us Himself. The words of the pastor are the words of Christ. It's the same forgiveness that you get in bed at night when you say, "Lord, forgive me my sins." And you say to yourself, and I know my sins are forgiven because of the promises of Psalm 103. 
promises of 1 John 1, right? The, the promises of Christ. I know that my sins are forgiven. Do you hear God say it? No, not really, right? I mean, if you, if you do, I don't think I want to know. But, uh, but, but, but on Sunday morning, Isaiah 6 is what's happening in church. This is happening in church. We come into Yahweh's presence because He is present in word and sacrament declaring, woe is me. And Yahweh's servant, called her name pastor, forgives your sins as if Yahweh were doing it himself. Just without the burning coal, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. We're going to get to that in just a second. We're, we're going to get to that in just a second. Um, why do you think he confessed the sins of the people? Letter B. We have to do a couple first. Because the body has many parts, yeah. Okay, uh, good, good. How do we view? How do we view ourselves in American society today? As as tremendous individuals, right? Um, our nation is built on our individual individualistic nature. That's garbage. That is garbage. We are simply part of a whole. We're part of a whole in society, and especially in the church. Right? The scriptural view of society is that we belong to each other. Scriptural view of society, we belong to each other, and, and especially in the church. You see, um, Isaiah doesn't stand in the presence of Yahweh and say, but, but I'm better than those people. I'm sinful, but I'm not. Ooh, I'm not like those people that go up on the high places. I don't go up on the high places. Nope. Isaiah puts himself in the same bag as everybody else. Sinful and unclean. And I live among the people who are sinful and unclean. Right? There is no holier than thou in the church. No holier than thou in the church. You're not even holier than the unbeliever. Except by the grace of God, who sees you as holy. But you, in and of yourself, are no holier than the pagan walking around the street. In and of yourself, no holier. You are man or woman of unclean lips, and you dwell among the people of unclean lips. Whether they're part of the church or not, all in the same sinful condition. And the answer or the response is, woe is me. I need the Lord's forgiveness because I can't do it myself. Um, number eight. With the words unclean lips, Isaiah summarizes the sinful condition in which both he and his people are found. Why do you suppose Isaiah chooses this particular phrase as he confessed his and his people's sin? What do you suppose? What do you suppose? Uh, well, Isaiah 29, 13 kind of gives it to you, doesn't it? What, what's the sin of unclean lips? What does what do the lips do? The lips proclaim the Lord and the heart's not. Yeah, right. Isaiah 29, 29, 13 really helps us with, with that understanding, right? There's hypocrisy and a lack of integrity, right? Our lips proclaim and our heart does something different. Right? And, and uh, think about the people you know even in the church. Maybe also ourselves. How often do we proclaim to be follower of God but live in a different way, doing different things? All right, so I think unclean lips, that's a good confession that, uh, that uh, Isaiah makes. How does God, through the seraph, respond to Isaiah's confession? Bring in the coal. By bringing the coal. So what does what does he get? Purified. All right, he gets purified, which we would call. Well, 
atonement for his sins, right? Yeah, guilt right. Removed. Christian that word, forgiveness, right? Um, full forgiveness. Isaiah receives full forgiveness. It's also, it's also what kind of forgiveness? What does Isaiah do to receive this forgiveness? Nothing. Nothing. It is absolutely free forgiveness. Isaiah doesn't say, ha, uh, let, me, let me do some good works to prove my heart to you, even though I'm a man of unclean lips, let me, let me do something to merit it, right? Nothing. This is full and free forgiveness. Full and free forgiveness given to him. And, and the coal from the altar. What's the significance of that? Coming from God. Coming from God. What's the altar used for? Sacrifice for sin. The coal from the altar. Right? Picks up on what Mark was saying a minute ago. The coal from the altar is very sacramental. God is using God is using a coal from the altar of sacrifice to bring forgiveness to Isaiah. It's incredibly sacramental. It's a physical thing. It's a physical thing, right? And so when we are in the presence of Yahweh, what's the physical thing that we receive? His body and his blood. His body and his blood from the altar, altar of sacrifice, from the cross, we receive also that sacramental forgiveness. And I'll connect it to the words of absolution because Luther... Luther basically considered the absolution as our third sacrament. The problem with absolution being a sacrament is that there's no visible element to it. No visible element. But it's doing the same thing that the Lord's Supper does, that baptism does. And so Luther really, really regarded the absolution, confession absolution, as the third sacrament. Um, and so, so very sacramental here, again, what's happening in Isaiah 6 is what happens on Sunday morning. Isn't that cool? I mean, um, how, how God takes something that happened, you know, uh, 2,700 years ago and just kind of transports it to today when we're in church. See? This, is, this is the <laughs> problem. Problem is, I don't know, relative term, I guess. I think it's a problem of, of uh, just taking what the church has always done and throwing it out the window and doing kind of free-for-all. Hey, let's praise Jesus and hear a little bit of his word and do some prayers and, and just kind of free-for-all kind of stuff. And maybe not even hear the confession of solution. That's the one problem I have with my sister's church in California. It's just like... Right? And, and, and I don't feel like I'm going to church. I feel like I'm going to a concert or something. The reason the church does what it does today is because it's what happened in Isaiah 6. And what happens in Isaiah 6 is incredibly important in the life of God's people. And so the church has always done what it's done in Isaiah 6. And for a time, for a time, the church went through a really stupid period where they practiced the Lord's Supper four times a year or once a month or then, or then in, in every other week, right? At both services every other week. So you actually come to God's house and not receive the Lord's Supper or, uh, you know, every other service, right? I took way too long to change that here. Um, this is, this is why the church from the beginning celebrated the Lord's Supper when they came together. Not sometimes when they came together, but when they came together. Because it's sacramental. It's what's happening in Isaiah 6. So Isaiah 6. That's what's happening. And that's why the church has always done that. Not a 
free for all, do whatever you want, and you know, we'll we'll do something for God. No, it's all about God doing for us. Are there responses? Sure. Did Isaiah have any responses? The rest of his life. Absolutely had a response. Who will go for us? Who will ascend? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. It was a great response. After the gospel, there's a response. After the gospel, well, we do some singing, right? We give an offering. But the real response, and I've been I've been hard, I've been on this since we did Hebrews last year. Hebrews just like I've studied Hebrews before, I've read Hebrews before, right? But when we did the Life Life Study on Hebrews, um, when Jess and I kind of just targeted that idea, right? Um, this is what God does us. And our response of worship is to go out those doors and live the life Christ has given us to live. That's our worship. That's the response. I won't diminish. I mean, we do sing and we collect an offering and those things are great and important and, and all of that and part of the worship service, right? Um, but our response really entails, our response to worship entails living the life that Christ gives us. How does Isaiah respond? Here my son me. I will go and do the commands of the Lord. I will go do the commands of the Lord. That's Isaiah's response to the gospel. Isn't that cool? That's, that's Sunday morning, week after week. That's what happens here. Sunday morning, Isaiah 6. And it's, and it's at, as glorious as it was there, except we don't actually see, see Yahweh or the seraphim, but, but it's all happening. It's all happening. Woe is me, forgiveness from the Lord's servant, sacramental, our response, living like Christ that wants us to live. Every Sunday morning, Isaiah 6. And, and that's why I think it's good for a church to continue to be an Isaiah 6 church and not just sort of a free-for-all, worship is about me and what I do for God. Sunday morning is about what I do for God. No, it's not. No, it's what he does for us. It's not. not about what I do for God. I do for God when I leave the place and live my life. That's me doing for God. And I do for God really by doing for my neighbor. And so that really rolls us back to Uzziah and Jotham. And our witness is part of what I do uh, for Christ and the people around me. Right? That witness is part of the importance. Live in the vocation that God's given you to live. Live in all of those things in life. Questions, comments? It's cool stuff, isn't it? Uh, since Isaiah's ministry would involve speaking for God, why would you, why would this specific assurance of forgiveness, absolution, have been particularly meaningful for him? Oh, um, yeah. So what you're supposed to pick up from this is how how exactly did the angel give forgiveness? He is a man of unclean lips, and so the angel touches the coal to his lips. What's the What's the significance? That's what the question is asking. What's the significance and how is that tied to what Isaiah would do? Purification of what he was going to speak. Yeah, so, so the instrument used to speak God's word is purified for the holy task of proclamation. Right? His, his lips are, um, the instrument of that proclamation is purified because that proclamation is the holy work of God. I mean, it's very, it's very uh, uh, symbolic of what's going on. That's really what the, what the question is getting at, right? Um, could have Isaiah said, oh, woe is me, I'm a sinful man. A absolutely, he could have done that. Uh, and, the, and the angel could have touched the coal to his forehead or to his heart, right? But, but it's all just kind of symbolically significant because what the Lord is doing is the Lord is calling him to speak for Yahweh. Speaking for Yahweh is an awesome task. 
And so, his lips need to be purified to speak the holy words of God. You should pray the same thing for your pastors and vicar. You should pray the same thing for your pastors and vicar. That, that they would actually be enabled, empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak the holy words of God on Sunday morning. Right? Just like Isaiah. So again, again, what, what happens what happens on Isaiah 6 happens on Sunday morning. Right? And, and so, so my prayer, um, uh, my prayer that I speak often before I, before I preach, I always pray before I preach. I don't know if you've ever seen me. I usually stop on one of the verses of the hymn and bow my head and, and not sing. If I'm not singing during the sermon hymn, I'm praying about the sermon. And, and my prayer usually goes like this. It's kind of, it kind of has become the same thing. But um, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh, I'm our and my Redeemer. And I usually say some other things, but, right, the words of my mouth. Let the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. Why? Because they need to be your holy words. They need to be the words that you have given to proclaim to the people. Um, my, uh, my son has a friend at Lutheran High School who is, uh, I think he's, I don't know, some branch of Pentecostal maybe, or... I don't know what he is. I think he's Pentecostal. But he has, for the last few years, they, he goes to this youth camp, and part of the youth camp is uh, um, like a, a, I don't know, they write sermons and, and preach these sermons and um, do this kind of thing at this youth camp, and he's won like awards at this youth camp for preaching. And it's like, interesting. That's not the task that you're given to do as a teenager. Go to the, go to the seminary and, and learn, learn the task and become a pastor um, because the pastor is the one called by God to um, um, preach like that, to preach to God. He's even preached a few times in church, right? Um, so I don't, I don't just ask Mark Chapin to get up and preach in church. Hey, Mark, this Sunday, why don't you preach for me? Um, no, no, no. Um, because there's more to it than simply um, Mark Chapin or, or Angela Hodge getting up and preaching um, for the people. There's more to that. And um, there's, there's, there's a, a training that needs to happen and there needs to be um, a, a call that needs to happen because it's the servant of God, like Isaiah, proclaiming the very words of God. And we believe that the sermon, uh, we believe that the sermon, uh, as in as far as the pastor doesn't screw it up, is the word of God. We would hold it, we would hold it at the at the same standard as Scripture, in, in as far as the pastor doesn't screw it up. Now that's a pretty big caveat that uh, kind of messes things up at times. But um, so yeah, so so Isaiah's lips are actually purified for that proclamation of the gospel. Kind of cool, right? You should pray. You should pray that that your pastor's lips are purified for the proclamation of the gospel, and that you will hear um, the good word of God for for your salvation and your. Um, um, I don't know, for your salvation, for your uh, uh, willing response to the gospel. Any other questions or comments on that? So let's take a look at Isaiah 6, 8 to 13, because that's, that's here, then we get into Isaiah's response. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and say to this people, Keep on... Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and the ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitation and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and... Uh, Yahweh removes people far away, 
and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a tenebrith or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So, um, number 10, well, Isaiah uh, heard God's word of gracious and unconditional forgiveness. Then Isaiah heard God's voice one more time. God uh, spoke a word of invitation and challenge. Um, he spoke a word of law and gospel. That would be a better way to say that. This time God spoke a word of law and gospel. Um, Reread verse 8. The word translates I am lost literally means dumbstruck or silenced by the fear of destruction. What did I say what did Isaiah say when he first spoke again? Here am I, send me. Right? Um, study verses 9 to 13 carefully. Isaiah's ministry would not be an easy one. What specific phrases from the text reveal this? 9b, 9c, 10a, 10b, 10, 11b, 11c, 12, and 13. I mean, I have like eight of them at least. And I may not have even listed all of them, right? Um, what, uh, what specific phrases from the text reveal that this is not going to be an easy task? They can't hear, they can't see. They, they can't hear, they can't see. Their hearts are hardened. dull, hardened, right? That, hardened hearts. So, so this isn't a, you know, keep on hearing, um, go and say to this people, keep on hearing but do not understand, keep on seeing but do not perceive. Uh, make the heart of this people dull and the ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Right? So, so why is God being so mean? Why is God being so mean? That doesn't sound like a good and gracious God. It sounds like when he hardened Pharaoh's heart. It sounds like when he hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? The people's hearts are hard. And, and, and they're going to hear your message, Isaiah, and they're going to do what? Ignore, Ignore it. Ignore. Reject it. Turn aside from it. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. But you proclaim that message anyway. You proclaim that message of law. Even though they're not going to listen because their hearts are hard. I know they're not going to listen because their hearts are hard. But I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them another hundred years. I'm going to give them another hundred years to hear and turn back to me. That's a long teaching. Isn't that amazing? God is, God is so amazingly patient with his people, Israel. So amazingly patient. I'm going to give you a hundred years. Isaiah, you're going to preach this message of law, and they're not going to hear because their hearts are hardened. But nevertheless, I'm going to give them time to turn back to me. And guess what? Some will. Some will turn back. Some will turn back. So number 12, number 12 it says for personal reflection, sharing optional. Um, nah. Uh, think about your own life. When are you personally more likely to hear but not hear? Uh, as God speaks to you through his word. I, I think this is a good question and we can just all out ourselves. Um, I, don't, I don't think this is one that we have to do. Um, we necessarily have to do personal reflection. I mean, if you don't want to share, you don't have to, but but I think it's this is this is a good question to actually talk about. When are there times when you hear but don't hear? When I'm angry. When you're right. When you're distracted. When I'm angry. When you're angry. When you think you're right and you already made up your mind. When you think you're right. I have one of those meetings tonight. Um, <laughs> had one of those meetings last Tuesday too. Um, when not, you... not me. Not me. <laughs> others. Yeah, right when you think you're right and you made up your mind and everybody else is wrong. Well, when is you're being personally attacked? 
Oh, and you're being personally attacked. Okay. What about in church? When you're in church on Sunday morning, when do you hear but not hear? When your mind wanders. When your mind wanders, right? When your mind wanders and you're thinking about, you know, I don't know, how terrible Vicar's sermon. I mean, <laughs> how, how terrible, how terrible Pastor Adam's sermon is. Lunch. And uh, you're thinking about lunch, you're thinking about what we're gonna do today. You got a big bill due, where am I gonna get the money? Got a big bill due, right? And, and our minds wander from God's word, right? And it's like, oh wait, stop. Phew. Call it back and listen, no matter, no matter how hard it might be to listen, um, call back. Call back your wandering just mind. Just when I was doing the study, it was like. Say it again. Just when I was doing the study, it was like. You start thinking about other stuff, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, what do I want to give people sex? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a huge. I mean, I think all of your answers were actually pretty good because I wasn't really thinking that way. Um, I was thinking of that that kind of daydreaming. Or, or, you know, you should read the Bible or have a devotion. But, you know, there's other things that you do and you don't get around to it. You postpone it until the afternoon instead of doing it when you normally do it. Right, and right, right. It gets away from you. Exactly. The, yeah. evening, the evening has gone too long and Amy is ready to go to bed and the boys are scattered and uh, it's easier not to do devotion and prayer together and commend it to each of them individually, right? That it's just uh, when you're busy. I think when you're busy, that's another big one. So when you're distracted, when you're busy, but I like when you're angry or when you think you're right, I think those are really good ones also. Um, yeah, I just thought that that was a great question to do more than just personal reflection. Um, the Number 13, the people would undergo some terrible consequences because of the hardened rebellion. But still, God gives reason for hope. So, what's, what's the consequence of their hardened rebellion? What's going to happen to them? Destruction. Cities destroyed. Cities destroyed, but what's going to happen to the people? Scattered. Captivity. Captivity, right? What happens to the people of Judah is captivity. They are taken from the land. Who's left? The old and the sick are left. But they're taken from the land. Um, so, in, in uh, what words in verse 13 speak of the hope Judah would have? There's a holy seed. Yeah. A holy seed. There are a few faithful that will remain. The nation will sprout again. It reminds me of I, uh, Elijah's, is it Elijah's lament? Um, Lord, Lord, take me. Because I am the only one left. When he is fleeing from Ahab and Jezebel after the Mount Carmel thing, I am the only faithful person left in Israel. And what the, do you remember what God says? It always cracks me up. No, no. No, you're not the last one. I, I preserve 700 who have not bowed their knees to Baal. What? 700 believers? 701 believers? I'm, I'm like, that is just dumbfoundingly amazing, isn't it? There are 701 believers at the time of Elijah. That's not, not very many. And, and, and that remnant will always be preserved. There will always be that preservation of a remnant. I will see to it because I am Yahweh. And Satan will not have every believer. Satan's our hope that we will always have a room. And and that is that is how we live too, that we are part of that faithful remnant until Christ comes again. Right? Um, and and the and the prayer of the faithful is that the Lord preserves that faithful remnant until he comes again. Yeah. Right? And and that's why that's why, yeah, I do not like the state of the Christian church in America today. Uh, I, I like it even less in Europe because that is the direction that America seems to be going, um, where hardly anybody seems to be faithful. They might call themselves Christians, but people actually receiving God's gifts are very few uh, across Europe, and it's becoming fewer and fewer in America also. But, but, 
God will always preserve the church. Right? It might be small, but it will be it, there. It might be small, but there will always be the church. And actually, compared to compared to Elijah's 700 um, faithful people in his day, um, there are a lot of people who truly are Christians, right? I have, I have no doubt that there are many still worldwide who are truly believers, um, far more than that 700. But, but no matter how bad things might get for the Christian church or how, um, how many people turn away from the Lord, there will always be that faithful remnant because God promises. Day 4, Isaiah 1, 1 to 20. So now we back, go back to the beginning. <laughs> Isaiah 1. The vision of Isaiah son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Is this still recording? Yep. Oh, that's good. <laughs> How far am I walking out of the camera when I come up here? Yep. Yep? Excellent. I'll we'll have to reposition that next time, but that's okay. Um, rookie mistake over there. Um, <laughs> so four kings, right? He, Isaiah prophesied for a long time, and we can kind of match these dates. Um, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Yahweh has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey his master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children uh, who deal corruptly. They have forsaken Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They, have utterly they are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. All bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In, in your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in the vineyard like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have become been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Um, what, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says Yahweh. I have had enough of burnt offerings and of rams uh, and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense in the in, is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity uh, and solemn assembly. Uh, you, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now. Let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you, But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. So Isaiah was a mighty seer, like all of God's Old Testament prophets. Isaiah saw, really saw the condition of the people. Uh, number 14, seer that he is. Isaiah paints several word pictures in today's reading. 
Uh, these pictures portray the dire straits in which God's people find themselves, even though uh, the people themselves don't see things this way. List, list the pictures of sin and rebellion painted by the prophet, like rebellious children, people loaded down with guilt. What other ones do you see? A deal corruptly. Evil doers. Evil doers. Open souls. Say again. Foreigners devour your land. Foreigners devour your land. The whole body is sick and corrupt. Everything. Yeah, the whole body is sick with touch, sin. Everything you touch becomes bad. Yep. Nation is burned, people are deserted, trample God's house, bloody hands, turn backs. Uh, there's a ton of them, right? He could have uh, kept writing and writing, really. Um, Isaiah also sees a beautiful picture of God's love. If you were to commission an artist to paint that picture, what details would you have included? That's kind of an artsy-fartsy question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote something kind of silly. Yeah. Did anybody draw a picture? <laughs> anybody, anybody draw a picture? All right. Um, yeah, so, uh, I don't know. Mark? I just said a, a white lamb with red blood flowing down a grain, which means, you know, oh. your sins are... That's kind of cool. ...being discarded. A white lamb in the bathtub... Uh, with the blood flowing down the drain. That <laughs> would be a cool picture. I think you should uh, paint that. Um, You'd never recognize it. <laughs> 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 I are an engineer. <laughs> white. That's a good point. Good point. Um, how do I draw a white lamb in a white bathtub? Um, read Isaiah 1, 21 to 31. Let us... Um, um, what do we have here? Uh, well, let's uh, let's forego that. Let's ask the question. Right as you begin your study, blah blah blah. God's people also transgressed the first table of the law, three uh, first three commandments. They did not love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, they did not listen to God's word or His representatives who spoke God's word. Uh, verses twenty nine and thirty one. Refer to the idolatry into which God's people had fallen. The sacred oaks or tenebrae trees and gardens were sites reserved for idol worship. Isaiah says the people will someday be ashamed and disgraced or embarrassed as they remember what they did there. What idols in the lives of God's people today are shameful and an embarrassment? Watch now for me first. All right, watching out for me first. All right. Gotta take um, care of me and, and take care of somebody else. And hope, hope then is, hope then is found in me. Mm -hmm. Right. Hope then is found in me. What other idols do people have? Greed. Uh, greed. Right. Again, hope in me. Right. If I can accumulate, then I have hope. Right. The one who dies with the most toys wins. Right. That kind of mentality. What other idols do people have? Power. Right. Power. Um, power and you know greed. Greed is not just hope in uh, hope in idolatry, but it's also a Yahweh replacement idolatry. And and uh, you said power. Power would be kind of a, a Yahweh replacement um, uh, idolatry. What uh, what other idolatry? Well, I, I put false preachers. I, I'm um, false false preachers. I think I think that's uh, that's actually a really good one. Um, that gives false hope. Right? False hope. Um, uh, works righteousness. It goes right along with kind of false teachers. False teachers, works righteousness, um, right? Puts hope hope somewhere where it's not found. Um, what other kinds of idolatry are there? Well, I put down people in the public eye, and then you find out they're not as great. They're supposed to be lifted up as people to immolate. Yeah, so, so, uh, so other people, right? And, and hope can be put in other people. 
um, uh, other people can kind of replace God, right? Um, it, it's all about our nation, and my hope is in the president, not in the Lord, right? I care less and less about politics the older I get because it just doesn't, I, I don't find that it really matters that much anymore. There are some, there are some policy things that I think would be better for our nation, and, and I would like to see the poor poor treated better and I would like I would like uh, I would like immigrants to be treated better it would be it would be nice to let anybody come to America and make it easier to become citizens I, I think honestly that would be a good a, a good thing I don't think uh, there are border walls in the uh, Bible um, and uh, I don't I don't think that's uh, very loving as Christians to say keep out um, we don't want you. That's just not, that's antithetical to um, Christian mind. If you are in favor of border wall, um, I'm in favor of, of people following the law, most definitely, but I think our laws need to be changed to make it easier for people to become citizens. I, but um, harder to keep the criminals out. Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I think there should be huge consequences some, some for, way, yeah. for that, right? But, um, yeah. I, uh, I, I think it would be really easy to take care of illegal immigration and just um, make it immigration. <laughs> I, think, I think we'd take care of illegal immigration if we uh, uh, just let people immigrate and, and did it well and um, however you wanted to do it, give them work, give them work cards or uh, give them citizenship or you know, it's kind of silly that it took Juan Martinez, member of our church, so long to become a citizen. He finally became a citizen. I was on Facebook. It was pretty cool. I uh, congratulated him. Um, that happened um, just, I don't know, a few weeks ago. He became a citizen. But it took a long time to become a citizen. That's just, that's just silly. Well, pastor, that's no different. And, and a lot of money. In any country in the world, you're, not, you're going to find the same thing. Yeah, I don't, but, but is it... Is it is it necessarily Christian to say keep out? I don't know that it's See, I don't think that's a Christian. I just think that it's the rest So, so anyway, say, my, my point is, is just I think, um, I think uh, uh, we don't have to put our hope in government, right? I think people put hope in government. People put hope in, in the economy. People put hope in things that just, they come and go. But, but it's the word of the Lord that endures, so put hope in the word of the Lord. But, but politics, government, economy, right, those are all things, all, all things that lead to idolatry. Um, letter B, how could God's promise to cleanse and restore his Old Testament people also comfort you today as you think about the false gods on which you sometimes rely? Well, God sent the ultimate cleanser and restorer in Jesus so that even when our false gods fail us, he's always there to forgive our sins and cleanse and restore. I like how you said that. That's, a, uh, that's, a, uh, that's kind of a cool moniker for Jesus. The ultimate cleanser and restorer. That's, I kind of like, like that. We don't usually necessarily call Jesus cleanser and restorer, but that's a good that's a good uh, uh, Good moniker for him. Uh, he's the ultimate cleanser and restorer. So, so uh, uh, he he's the one, right? Um, uh, God confirmed His promises to Israel in Christ's resurrection. He confirmed our promise of forgiveness. Where? Resurrection. Where did he Where did he confirm your forgiveness? Not to us. Yours in baptism. I mean, on the cross isn't wrong. It's not wrong. But, but right, he, he, uh, he uh, uh, confirmed your forgiveness in holy baptism. Right? Um, and so, uh, close, close with these words. These are a couple of words. Uh, Psalm 130. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Um, we use those words in uh, confession sometimes, right? Those are, I think that's Divine Service 4, maybe? I don't remember. Um, Divine Service 4, maybe. Uh, and then, and uh, yeah, so if you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. So kind of cool... Uh, 
uh, uh, ending ending of that lesson. All right. Any other thoughts, comments? All right, awesome. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we rejoice and give you thanks that you are a God who um, seeks to uh, love and redeem your people. Um, we know that we are people of unclean lips and we dwell among people of unclean lips. And yet you so graciously invite us into your presence and shower us with your gifts of grace in word and sacrament. You, you richly and, and daily forgive our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. We ask, Lord, that you would um, help us to be like Isaiah and uh, uh, declare, here am I, send me, and then uh, that you would send us forth from this place week after week to do your will in the world around us, that you would help us to live out our lives of faith as we uh, worship you by uh, serving of those in the world that you put us into contact with as you help us to be faithful to the many vocations that you have given to us. We ask, Lord, that you would bless us throughout the rest of this week and gather us again um, to hear your word, receive your gifts um, this coming Sunday. Um, it's in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. Amen. Um, two things. Is everybody on the email list? Did I, have I missed anybody in this class on the email? Did you get my email, that, that original one that I sent out that explained the, the books and um, how to use the books and all of that? You don't think you've got my email? When Carrie gets everything, I get nothing. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a congregation email. Oh, it was okay. sent from my personal account. So you should have all gotten it. So, you know, Dean, you don't think you got it? You know, Pastor, I think that that week I got that message and I got the info as you go because it was when the men was gone. And they went into my spam folder. Mm -hmm. Even that, I did. And yeah, and they have been. And so you know, since then they have because I went not spam. Interesting. So if you miss a class, just like last year, I'll send a I'll send an email with the YouTube link so that you can watch class if you if you want to do that. Um, but Dee, you don't think you got it? No, I don't. I'm looking. Did you get it? I can't. I can't. All right, I'll check if you're on the list. I do. Anybody else? I didn't want to write down everybody's name because um, okay. all right. Everybody else got it. Yeah. All right. Um, then the other thing is, is uh, so the books the books are like ten dollars, but I. Uh, I don't want to charge anybody who doesn't want to pay or can't pay for Bible class, so I have a, uh, I don't know, I have a thing about paying for God's Word, and, and I, like, I like the church providing things, but, but I don't mind people, I don't mind people assisting the church in paying for those things. So, if you want to give $10 for your book, you are certainly welcome to do that. If you say, you know what, I'm not in the position to do that, I'm okay with that too. So, um, I, don't, I don't want to make that a hard and fast rule or law. Pass that on this evening also, or tomorrow evening, uh, for the class as well. All right. Yeah, I think I wrote a check for the last year's and it never got cashed. <laughs> really? Like, Mine even showed up on my statement, which surprised how me. How weird. Um, technically, as a consumable, you should not uh, get any tax break for it. Uh, just like if you buy flowers, yeah. um, you well, should get tax break for those. We've got to tell John not to put it on there. <laughs> um, it might show up. It might show up as. It's all listed right Taxable. in Taxable. It's no, just listed in there. Right in the that, that, was, that was a mistake. He doesn't usually do that. There's an the line item on there that's, not, that's taxable. I think is what it is. So. I, I think there is. If it gets input right, there's a taxable line um, in there. But um, donations that are taxable. So um, you can uh, give it to me. You can you can drop it by the office. You can use, use the blue envelope. It's the blue envelope, envelope that's right? That's the one I use on Sundays. Green is for flowers and yellow is for capital campaign. I think it's the blue envelopes. We put out there for other donations. It just mark it on there that it's for lifelike, and then it all gets put back into the right account. But, yeah. <laughs> all right. Do you yeah. Want to take anything? Um, no, I will take it. I will take it because I mean, I I don't think you're technically supposed to get credit for it. So if you have it, I can take it today. If not, you can bring it next week. You can drop it in the offering plate. Just make sure don't put it in your offering envelope because because then it won't go to lifelike. That would be the biggest, yeah. the biggest thing with it. All right.
Awesome. Pastor, your prayer that you said you say before your sermon? At the beginning? Yeah. The, our count, our, the pastor that confirmed me taught us one that I still say every day before, or every Sunday before the service begins. Lord, open thou my heart to hear, and through thy word to me draw near. Let me, let me thy word still pure retain, and me thy child in air remain. It just kind of... I've heard that prayer before. Sets the tone. That's a really cool prayer. Sets the tone for preparing for words like when you say when the prelude's going or whatever. That's easy. There, there are some really nice prayers in the front of the hymnal also. <laughs> like before worship, at the beginning of worship, at the close of worship, I, before communion. I don't know. Is there one before the sermon too? I don't know. I don't, think so. I don't remember. I don't think so. But that would be kind of a cool one to include before because, before because what, you're, what you're praying there is that the Lord would keep you from being distracted yes. during the preaching of the word. Right? Yeah, we right? It's a, we well, that's a very cool, that's a very cool prayer. Yep. We want to be right? Yeah. All right, thanks all. Have a great week, and uh, you'll have Vicar next week.